respond to the questions, but of course, you're most welcome to uh, chip in or raise your hand. I will be using the electronic, uh, the Zoom features of electronic hand. So if you do want to take the floor, do let me know. I've got the, the screen in front of me and it will help me direct the questions to you. So with those few words of introduction, when you're ready, we can we can start this. Uh, we can get going. Many thanks. Javier, can you let me know when we go live? Say that again, Simon. Could you let uh, could you let me know when we're live? We are live. We are live. Fantastic. Simon, okay. You can proceed. Many thanks indeed, Javier. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Simon Mizrahi. I am the acting director of communications and external relations at the African Development Bank, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this closing press conference to the bank group's 2021 annual meetings. We will have the pleasure of spending the next hour together. Je vous dire quelques mots en français, soyez tous les bienvenus. Say a few words in French. Uh, most welcome to all of you to this uh, uh, press conference uh, for the closing of our annual meetings. I will switch back into English, but please feel free to ask your questions in French or in English. We are a perfectly bilingual institution. By thanking you for spending this last three days with us, and I hope. You've enjoyed these virtual meetings as much as we have. I know that the president has taken particular pleasure of spending these three days with us and uh, has enjoyed each and every one of the participations we've had uh, with you. Uh, as you know, these annual meetings are our biggest and most important gatherings of the year. This year, we have brought together Listen well, 30,000 participants, over 30,000 participants via social media, um, and roughly about 5,000 have been connected uh, to these meetings via Zoom. I think we've had some absolutely fascinating conversations and some fantastic speakers, not only, of course, from the 81 uh, governors who, with whom we've been actively engaging in the course of this meeting, but we've also had a very impressive array of heads of state heads of organizations, heads of governments, and, uh, the, and of course, the bank's uh, stakeholders. We were particularly keen to bring in to this conversation um, the voices of the young people from across uh, the continent, and we've beamed them in in every uh, opportunity that we've had to provide them with an opportunity for them to share their perspectives uh, with us on the future of this continent. In the course of the last three days, we have debated some of Africa's most pressing development challenges. We discussed the challenges of strengthening Africa's resilience in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And even more importantly, what we've done is we've debated, we've examined the solutions that will allow African countries to emerge from the, bet from the pandemic even better and even stronger. We looked at how we can best address Africa's debt, better support climate adaptation, and you've heard it today, we had a, a very fascinating conversation around Africa's health infrastructure. Before we go to your questions, let me make some brief introductions, starting with Dr. Akinwumi Adeshina. The president of the African Development Bank Group does not need, I think, any introduction. We also have it with us Finance Minister Ken Ofori Atta of Ghana. He is the chairman of the Board of Governors of the African Development Bank Group. We also have around the virtual table a number of senior officials and vice presidents from the African Development Bank. In particular, let me start with Swazi uh, Chabalala, the acting senior vice president and the chief financial officer. We have Vincent Mehiele, the secretary general of the African Development Bank Group, together with most of uh, the relevant um, vice presidents from the African Development Bank. So with those words of introduction, let me say, let me share with you a few housekeeping rules before we take your questions. So we would very much like you, please, members of the press, to state your name and the media organization that 
you represent. Also, if you're not speaking, please turn the mute button on so we don't create too much uh, interferences. Please ask only one question uh, rather than a series of a question because we've got some limited time and we want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to raise their questions. Uh, I'll be taking um, questions in batches of three. Please use the Zoom function, hand function, so that I can see who wishes to take the floor. And with those words of introductions, let me now uh, ask you who would like to make the first question. So I see we have a very shy members of the press today. We have received a number of questions that have been sent to us by the press, I hope. Uh, let, let's start with those questions. And maybe the first question um, to you, uh, Mr. President, and to you, uh, well, I think all three of you, uh, Minister Kenneth uh, Oforiata, and to you, the Secretary General, about the formats of the meeting. So the first question that I have is, what is the future for virtual meetings for the African Development Bank in the current context and for the coming years? Do you think we will be seeing more of them? Um, Mr. President, I'll start with you because uh, I know you have very strong views about this, and then I'll turn to Minister uh, Ofori Atta and then to the Secretary General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, let me thank the members uh, of the media for being here with us um, for this event. It's great to have uh, Honorable Minister, the Chair, person of the uh, Board of Governors of the Bank here with us, Honorable Minister Ken Ofori Atta, the Minister of Finance for Ghana. Thank you very much, uh, Governor, for hosting us uh, in Ghana uh, live and virtual. Sorry, there's a feedback coming to my, yeah. So um, let me say that I'm also very delighted that we have so many uh, of you, the uh, members of the, of the media with us. I was counting the numbers. We have 39, almost 40 uh, journalists with us. So thank you very much for making the time to come. And uh, you couldn't come to a meeting that was more important because uh, we were talking about how to build resilient economies in the post-COVID-19 era. In fact, we are not in post-COVID-19 yet. We are still in the middle of COVID-19. And so that actually informed how the banks annual meetings um, have been done virtually. Normally we will hold it physically, as you all know. But, uh, and this format has worked uh, very, very well. Uh, we have, uh, you know, fantastic participation from around the world, all of our governors. Uh, we have distinguished speakers from all over the world, as you all know. So, I mean, to go straight to the point, what do I think in terms of how we organize meetings going forward? Of course, next year, we look forward to being in Ghana, right there with uh, His Excellency President, Nana for Ado, who will be hosting us next year, uh, with the uh, chairman of the board of, of direct uh, of, of governors of the bank, uh, the minister of finance of Ghana. So we have that. We have actually gone through uh, our board of directors with a cycle of our annual meetings uh, that have been uh, that have been there. The secretary general can tell you what those uh, cycles are, and so we will continue those cycles, which are the normal cycles. But you know, we also hope that COVID-19 with vaccinations uh, will um, uh, abate. Uh, of course, Africa only has 1% uh, of vaccinations right now. Hopefully over time that will abate and people can begin to return back to some kind of a normalcy. But I must tell you, I enjoy this format. I enjoy it for many reasons. First and foremost, it is very cost effective format. Um, you know, we don't have to go over to places. We don't have to uh, uh, spend money on hotels and transport and so on. And as a financial institution, you know, my, my first thing is cost effectiveness, uh, value for money. And the technology has allowed us to get that value for money uh, without having to actually do all the big things that uh, we do. Secondly, is that we are able to get participants from all over the world, heads of state, uh, global leaders from all over 
were able to join us just because they're just a click away using the, uh, uh, the technology uh, that we have. Uh, the level of engagement is much higher than I have ever seen. This is my sixth year as president of the bank. I have never seen this level of engagement uh, at the annual meeting like we saw. Um, and also the other thing that I feel it's uh, very, very important is it allows us to bring in the voices of the young people into the annual meetings. We did it this year. We had a lot of uh, young people participate because of the platform allows them to, uh, to be able to do that, which is really, really great. And finally, it's all about transparency. You know, uh, uh, this platform allows us to, you know, discuss our work. People listen to us from all over. They can ask us questions. And that's who we are. We're a very transparent bank. And I like this format because it allows us to engage with the African population, with the global population, you know, in a very transparent manner. So I think that uh, uh, going forward, I expect that we will uh, at least, uh, uh, I have to talk to my Secretary General, uh, I haven't talked to him yet, um, but I will expect we will have a, a hybrid mode uh, that will combine the efficiency, the cost effectiveness, and the reach of this platform with a physical medium. We'll go and do with both. Many thanks, uh, Mr. President. Now let me turn to Minister Kanofori Atta. Next year, Mr. Minister, we will be holding, as you just told us, the annual meetings uh, in Accra in your country. Um, um, what is your sense of the right format that would be uh, appropriate for next year's uh, annual meetings? I'll, I'll then turn to, to Vince for his views. Minister, I think you're muted. Um, thank you very much indeed for that and to thank um, the governors and the bank um, for giving us the opportunity to host. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the president, you know, has... Um, enumerated the benefits of online, um, but certainly as you know, uh, human beings a meeting makes a big difference and deals can be struck, etc. So we're looking forward to an Africa vaccinated, uh, which would enable us to meet uh, physically. Um, but uh, I imagine that we can combine um, the, the online uh, virtual service so that others will be able to, to tune in and that would be a feat that I guess the IT group should be able to do. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I think this was a great session, spirited and passionate, um, and really some landmark um, discussions uh, which will go a long way to strengthening the bank. Um, we, we have had a good three, day, good three days. Um, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And uh, over to you, Secretary uh, General. Um, I, I think what we heard from, from Minister Foriata, I think is the value of having hybrid formats that bring together the governors at Accra, but also that offer the benefit of being able to have uh, and extend our outreach through, uh, through, through IT and uh, virtual meetings. Uh, your views? Um, we have a number of questions I'll be asking. Uh, Josiane Rafasindramanga uh, will be asking the next question, and I've got some further questions that have been sent to me in writing that I'll be asking. In particular, uh, Mateus, maybe on the Lusophone Compact. But um, um, Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think the President and the Honorable Minister have um, really um, dealt with the question. But let me just say that, um, of course, we, I, I, I heard from a, num a number of governors who have really expressed the desire to meet physically. Um, we will give people options. Uh, those who feel safe enough to want to participate uh, physically will we'll allow them to identify. And those who want to remain to have it virtually so that we have a complete hybrid that is informed by people's um, uh, informed consent as to those who would like to travel. I think um, there's no been saying the fact that uh, hybrid will be likely the thing going forward. And of course, depending on what how people feel and how um, uh, penetrative the the vaccine becomes um, for us, um, for our member countries. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vince. So in the meantime, we've received a number of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll be taking them by batches uh, of three. Um, the first uh, question, uh, I think, will be addressed uh, to you and, the, and Minister at um, Has it been, this is a, has it been confirmed that the bank will be managing a fraction of the IMF SDRs on behalf of African countries, which is one of the questions that's just been asked. Um, and a second question, um, Africa's GDP forecast for this year is around 3%. How will the third wave of COVID-19 vaccine shortages and new economic lockdowns affect that outlook? Uh, for the third question, let me now turn to Josiane Rafizendramanga. Uh, from Madagascar, I take it. But uh, do you want to ask your questions to members of the panel, uh, Josiane, in English or in French? Oui, bonjour. Vous bonjour. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm in the Comoros. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon, everyone. My question, I have two questions for you, sir, with your permission. This, these annual meetings were virtual. What were the highlights of uh, the 2021 annual meetings. And my second question. Has to do with the media and the journalists and uh, for the three days of the annual meetings, you have had discussions on the economy and entrepreneurship but no one mentioned the problems of the media. And as a journalist, I have my shop, you know. Journalism is also hard hit by uh, COVID-19. The sector is highly affected by COVID-19. So I would like to know whether you are, you are planning to support the media sector. Thank you very much. I think I, I got your question. So I think uh, just to summarize the question that was asked to us from Josiane from the Comoros Island, I think a very good question is what are the main outcomes, conclusions that you take out of these uh, 2021 annual meetings? And I think the, the second one was a a comment rather than a question is that obviously the support um, to um, businesses in Africa is important. And there was a question around what support uh, might benefit uh, media organizations. So those are the three questions. So a first question on the use of the SDRs. I wanted to know whether it had been confirmed that the bank will be managing a fraction of um, IMF's FDRs on behalf of African, African countries. Second question, Africa's GDP forecast for this year is around 3%. How will the third wave of COVID-19 vaccine shortages and new economic lockdowns affect the outlook? And thirdly, I think your, your key takeaways uh, from this year's annual meetings. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. President. Thank uh, you very much. Just on the first one about the the SDRs, um, you know, the, the issue that we are discussing here, we have to benchmark it against what happened in 2008. Um, and also um, to recognize that at that time, SDRs were issued to help a world that was going through a global financial uh, crisis. Now, SDRs are not what you issue every single day. You only issue them when you have a, a global crisis that could create a systemic effect. Now, this particular time, the SDRs 
have been issued $650 billion to be issued by the International Monetary Fund. The first is how will the SDR, well, first is how much of the SDR should go to Africa? That was the first thing. The second one is how will they be redistributed? And what does that mean for us at African Development Bank? So the first one, how much actually goes of the SDRs will go to Africa? It was agreed in Paris at the financing in common, uh, financing for African economies that was chaired by President Macron, attended by several African heads of state, that um, Africa should get 100 billion, at least $100 billion of the $650 billion of SDRs to be issued. Statutorily, in terms of the allocations based on reserves and quotas at the, at the IMF, Africa's allocation will be about $33 billion um, you know, of the total. But that does not deal with the issues that Africa faces. Today, you have a continent that needs, you know, for low income sub Saharan African countries, it needs $245 billion by uh, 2030. It also will need, for all of sub Saharan Africa, $425 billion by 2030. So the fiscal space is very, very limited. So Africa needs a lot more. You know, Governor, uh, uh, Chairman uh, 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 Kendo Foriata has been leading African ministers of finance in terms of making the call for African governments to get, receive a lot of uh, resources to uh, uh, deal with their uh, fiscal deficits. We saw uh, developed countries spending well over $23 trillion, and Africa was looking last year for about $145 billion, and we couldn't really get it. The African Development Bank did its own part. We announced a $10 billion facility to support countries. We launched a $3 billion facility on the global capital markets, the largest ever in world history. But it was not enough. So the SDRs provide a real opportunity to now tackle this particular issue. So yes, $100 billion is, the, is, the, is what uh, the heads of state have talked about, and that's what was also agreed by the G7 uh, leaders uh, that they just uh, met. The second is how these SDRs are normally used. You normally use them to uh, deal with the issue of uh, 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 your reserves. But as I was saying in 2000, today, we are not dealing with just that problem. We're dealing with three problems. We're dealing with the issue of climate crisis. We're dealing with the issue of COVID-19 crisis. And we are dealing with the issue of debt crisis. So the use of the SDRs, therefore, shouldn't just be focused on the standard way in which it has been used, because the, 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 the situation is very different. And that's why we are making the case that uh, the SDRs uh, should be uh, issued uh, to a bank like ourselves, the African Development Bank, which I must say, we are a prescribed holder of the SDR, so we can receive it, so that we can unlend it to public development banks in, in Africa to support green growth, support uh, uh, climate resilient growth, to support inclusive growth, to create jobs. We have to create jobs for the young people. The minister was just talking about it last time. We've lost 30 million jobs. We've got to create that back. And so that is how we are asking that the SDRs, of course, be used. Now, on the question of whether that decision has been made, well, the recommendations have been made by the uh, uh, heads of state and global leaders in Paris. That was agreed that SDRs will be issued um, uh, uh, um, $400 billion to go to Africa. And that conversation continues at the annual meetings here, where there was very strong support for the African Development Bank to receive the SDRs from the president of Ghana, from uh, President Shisekedi, the chair of the African uh, Union, from the uh, chairman of African Union Commission. Everybody agrees that Africa should use it. I mean, African Development Bank should get it. And let me just say one thing. If we do get it, what that would mean, let's just say, for example, that we get it. We can leverage any amount of SDRs we get in Africa by four to five times as a triple A rated institution. So for example, if you have a $10 billion or for just taking an example, 
That will mean we can do we can we can leverage it five times as a triple rated institution to deliver fifty billion dollars of support. And so the issue of leverage is very important. Now those decisions, of course, uh, are going to go on. Uh, no firm decisions have been uh, have been made, but we have been encouraged by our board of uh, of governors uh, to continue that. They gave us strong support to continue that conversation together with the IMF and the World Bank and other donors. And I think. I am quite encouraged uh, by what the level of positive uh, uh, response we are getting to the need because Africa does need those resources to grow back very quickly. Many thanks, Mr. President. On the same question, on the question of the SDRs, uh, can we hear your take, uh, Minister Oforiata? No, I, I think really the President has elucidated, you know, exactly where we are and the urgency um, for a redefinition so the allocation uh, can come directly um, to to the bank um, to, to effect, you know, um, a more direct um, engagement um, to solve the, the issues which, in a sense, uh, came up in, in, um, in terms of the highlight issues for, um, for, for, for the three days. Um, the, the, the issue of pharmaceutical um, intervention um, such that, you know, the generics can be increased in terms of what we do. Um, the fact that we maybe produce 2% of the medicines we need and 1% of vaccines. Um, so to close that gap and make sure that the global supply chain does not affect us um, so badly. Um, so, so those are, are crucial. Uh, the whole re resolution of the, of the vaccine um, issue uh, and ensuring that we have the resources uh, to really tackle um, this youth problem and gender issue um, and, and really writing um, this anomaly of um, an external uh, multilateral having more resources than the bank, which knows more intimately uh, what the ground rules are and what we need. Um, so those were um, some of the highlights that came in the whole issue of an ecosystem um, such that for us finance ministers and health and, uh, and um, the, the science ministries, uh, we work together um, to increase you know, the, the level of um, commitment and, and investment uh, into the health sector, uh, which is needed. Thank you very much. Talking, talking about the banks, uh, sorry, the banks, Africa's future prospects. I think the second question was very much about uh, you know, projections and forecasts in terms of Africa's growth. So the question, the second question was Africa's GDP forecast is uh, expected to grow around 3%. How do you see this third wave of COVID-19 and the vaccine shortages uh, affecting Africa's economic outlook. It's a topic we've discussed uh, at length, Mr. President uh, and Minister. Um, what do you wish to say to members of the media here present? Mr. President? Well, um, first and foremost is uh, uh, the fact that the, if you look at vaccines, because to deal with it, the issue has to come down to that recovery of 3.4%. Uh, 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 that we project that Africa will grow back this year. And that's our projection, by the way. It's not just if it, just for the whole of Africa, but all of the economies, whether they are um, oil producing economies, whether they are tourism dependent economies, whether they are natural resources dependent or commodity dependent economies, or non resource dependent economies, all across the board, we project that things will improve in terms of um, economies, because as you open up economies, as supply chains begin to move, tourism begin to return, you know, you see greater uh, a, a, a recovery projected all across Africa. However, that recovery is conditional on two critical elements. First is access to vaccines. Second, it's resolving Africa's debt situation. So I'm going to talk about those two issues. Well, let me start with the issue of the vaccines. Today, Africa has less than 1% of its population vaccinated. 
Africa is not getting access to vaccines. The developed countries have essentially stockpiled on this. Advanced procurement was made that made it impossible for you. Even if you have the money, you couldn't really access it. Africa is at the, at the tail end of the uh, priority. And therefore, we are not getting in Africa the quantity we need. We're not getting it at the right time. We are not getting it at the right price. And this could imperil the growth recovery process of Africa. To be able to reach a level of normalcy, you need to be able to vaccinate up to about 60% of your population to reach a hard immunity. And we are at 1%. So you can see that the issue is actually quite there. So the issue of solidarity with Africa in terms of vaccines is very important. The issue of removing the bottlenecks to Africa's access to vaccine is important. And I want to uh, commend the efforts being made by the African Union uh, with regard to the African Union Vaccine Acquisition uh, Task Force that is there to be able to get access to vaccines. A lot of efforts have been made, but it's still a big difference from 1% to 60%, it's a lot. And some of these things are structural. And I think that, in my view, we shouldn't really have been in this situation. Africa should not be begging for vaccines. Africa should be producing vaccines. And that is why we at the bank have reached out to our governors. We just had a conversation. They encouraged us in this particular area. We expect as a bank over the next 10 years to at least invest about $3 billion in supporting pharmaceutical industry in Africa, which includes therapeutic drugs. But of course, aside from that, we are also going to support uh, the issue of vaccines. The second point that I want to raise with regard to that one is, if we can get access to vaccines, the situation is much better than when the uh, COVID-19 started. The level of preparedness in terms of testing centers, uh, diagnostic centers, um, in terms of uh, awareness, and all of that are much better today, but we gotta have the supply of the of the vaccines to shoot to, to shoot in people's arms. So I think that this is this third wave is particularly worrying because I see that it's come up in a number of countries because of the Delta variant, which is the one that is the Indian variant, and that is easily more transmissible and a lot more dangerous than other ones. That we have. So I think that vaccine, vaccine, vaccine access it is critical. Africa should produce its own vaccines, and we are working to make sure that Africa has the manufacturing capacity to be able to, uh, to be able to do that. Now, the other thing that I wanted to say had to do with the issue of debt. Africa's debt today is too high. And, that, and of great concern is the fact that, you know, if you have a continent where most of the debt is now, owed, I mean, a lot of the debt is now owed by the private sector, 40% of Africa's debt that is over uh, almost $849 billion is owed by external private creditors. It's owned by the private sector. And that's very expensive debt, it's short term, and this is a real problem. So you cannot run up a hill if you have a backpack full of sand. And so Africa cannot recover unless and until we really deal with the issue of debt. And I think positive efforts have been made with the Debt Service Suspension Initiative and also with the G20 Common Framework to look at how to deal with debt of private and the debt of the Paris Club uh, uh, bilateral. But we need to really resolve that problem. That's why I want to come back to what we said earlier. The use of the SDRs, part of it should be used to also bring down some of this very expensive debt, the private sector debt. 
creditors debt that Africa has to allow Africa space to be able to recover. But I'm very certain, I mean, I'm very encouraged by the donations of vaccines by G7 countries that was just uh, uh, said, that will at least get Africa the vaccine, some of the vaccines that it needs. But Africa cannot continue this path going forward. Africa must and will begin to produce its vaccines. Because I really firmly believe that we cannot put the lives of 1.2 billion people at risk to global value chains that does not prioritize Africa's needs. Many thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I, I think we're coming to the end, towards the end of this press conference. I know the minister has a pressing engagement at four o'clock that he needs to attend. So let me uh, leave you with this last uh, question uh, that I think you feel very strongly about, all of you very strongly about, um, and let me read it to you. <clears throat> How will the current socioeconomic climate affect women who are already bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Is it time for an emergency gender response for women? So how will this current socioeconomic climate affect women who are already bearing the brunt of the pandemic? Is it time for an emergency gender response for women? Um, I think Mr. really, I mean, for for Africa, we can hide um, the importance of women in our sociology, in our life, in our history. Um, it's just that the men seem to have sequestered the space <laughs> and um, we have not done as much as we could, but as you know, um, Africa Development Bank came out quickly out of the blocks um, to have various programs for them. Um, I mean, my suspicion is that when we talk about the deteriorating uh, impact um, that we have of 30 million going under extreme poverty and 39 million, it will likely be disproportionately distributed, uh, which calls especially the Canadians we're very strong on, you know, going through uh, a reassessment um, of where we are with women and to tackle it with some sense of urgency and vigor, uh, because we know um, that um, when we look at our um, traditional um, production, distribution, marketing systems and taking care of the future, um, it is the women that do it for 50 million youth and um, clearly the majority are, are, are women or girls, um, and it is the household that, do, that does it. Um, so yes, we, we're gonna have to be particular about that and even more deliberate about that into the future. And I imagine that the bank uh, will be up to, to the task. And we as finance ministers, uh, as we examine this whole youth budget, as to where to put our resources are going to have to profile it a lot better than we have in the past uh, to ensure that the issues of education, and health, and um, financial resources uh, are so programmed um, to support them. Thank you, Minister. And so please. Let me. Let me. Let me uh, yes, of course, Mr. President. What the mm. uh, chairperson of the Board of uh, Governors uh, has said. You know, as he was saying, I agree with him that this pandemic has actually affected women more disproportionately, and he's absolutely correct, because the majority of them are in the informal sector. And most of those that were in fact affected by that lockdown were those in the informal sector. That tends to be more disproportionately women in Africa. So therefore, the recovery process must prioritize inclusiveness for women. And this is very, very important in terms of access to finance. And the African Development Bank is, um, I mean, we've rolled out a program called Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, which is to help to mobilize $5 billion uh, of new financing for women uh, empowered businesses all across the continent. And it's working very, very well. 
I, we expect at the end of this year, from the bank's own resources and for what they call the AFAWA, the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa Guarantee Fund, we will be able to have provided lending of $500 million, that's a half a billion dollars, women empowered businesses in Africa by the end of this year. The other thing that I need to mention about women is that uh, I have read things in terms of sexual harassment and all of that. Uh, 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 women suffer from that in projects, in, in, I mean, just all over the place. And I, I even I, I, you read about sexual abuse being even higher with the, in the COVID situation than before. At the African Development Bank, we have a zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and harassment of women. And that's why I, as president of the bank, signed a directive just about a week ago. Zero tolerance for that within the bank, zero tolerance for it in all of our projects, anywhere at all, that we have that. We must make sure that women are safe, they can participate, they have equity, and that they are empowered. And finally, I want to also say that when it comes to the issue of what we are going to do for women, the, as a governor, uh, a, a, a chairperson, Minister uh, Ken Ofori Atta also said, we also have to invest in girls' education. We must make sure that the girls are not married out at the age of 13, age of 10. You're killing their future. Let all the old people go marry people of their age <laughs> and leave the young girls to go to school, to have the opportunity to have participation in a world where they can create opportunities for themselves. And we can't just, uh, you know, the, 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 we cannot have a situation where the girls are denied access uh, to, to education. And finally, is the whole issue of water and sanitation. Women and girls are more disproportionately affected in terms of lack of access to water and sanitation. In schools, in their homes, they spend sometimes in some places, they have to go five kilometers to go find water. And they miss schools. So girls' participation in school drops their performance drops and the drop out goes higher. So all I'm going to say is that in our programs at the African Development Bank, we are focused on making sure all our projects, 100% of them, are gender marked. In other words, there is no project that will be approved at the African Development Bank that does not show how it's going to impact on women and girls, we must be accountable for Africa's women. No bird flies with one wing. Africa will move faster and better and have more inclusive growth when it fully empowers all its women. And that's our job to do. And that's a responsibility we have. And that's a passion that I have as president of the bank. That's a fantastic way, I think, to bring to a close this uh, press conference. There are many hands, many questions that, uh, that would like to be asked. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of the time that is available to us. I know that the Mr. President has many engagements uh, right now, as does the Minister at Alfori. So I'd like to thank you. So this brings us to the end of this press conference. Uh, I think the quality uh, of the dialogue uh, as you said, Mr. President, at these annual meetings has been absolutely outstanding. We've had stellar contributions from so many of our partners, so many of our stakeholders. So on behalf of my colleagues, thank you all for taking the time uh, to cover these meetings and to attend this uh, closing press conference. The work of the bank, of course, continues in earnest, and we look forward to our continued engagement with all of you, with all of you. Stay safe, be well. Merci à tous pour votre participation à ces assemblées annuelles et portez-vous bien. Thank you all for your attendance and please stay safe.
not answer the question by Joseph from Comoros. Absolutely. And, yeah, and and uh, Her question was uh, to know what the recommendations are subsequent to our conversation. Let me just sum up by stating that we discussed the debt situation, Africa's debt situation, how we are going to reduce Africa's debt level. We also talked about the need for green growth for Africa and also to support renewable energies as well as energy transition for the continent of Africa. What we equally discussed was the need to set up a system for manufacturing vaccines on the continent of Africa, which is fundamental. We equally discussed the development of the pharmaceutical industry in Africa. We had discussions also to the effect that economic growth should be inclusive. It should include women and youths, as I just stated. We concluded on the importance for the IMF to ensure as it makes available the special drawing rights to ensure that the focus would be on promoting green growth, climate resilience, and inclusive growth. And for the continent of Africa, we said that we would need at least 100 billion US dollars. And some of the special drawing rights should go via the African Development Bank so that it can actually unlearn to all the development banks of the continent of Africa in a bid to promote faster growth for the continent of Africa. Lastly, we also pointed out the importance for Africa's private sector to benefit from support because the private sector is the engine of growth for Africa. And lastly, with respect to the debt situation, we need transparency in terms of the debt situation, transparency in terms of debt statistics collection, in terms of macroeconomic and fiscal management, as well as in terms of the natural resources governance for Africa as well as news for Africa. So the African Development Bank remains available to work with all media, social media, visual media, audio media, so that we can continue to convey information on the growth of Africa, achievements. It's up to you, the media, to do this together with Mr. Simon, Ms. Rahi and his colleagues who are always available to work with you. The media are the spokes voice of the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer this question, Mr. President. And I think indeed it is very important for you to answer all the questions raised by uh, members of the media in the spirit of transparency. For all the other questions, I know there was a specific question from Baria Batista. Do not hesitate to get in touch with us. A few more questions. I can take a few more if you have a lot more questions, just so that we. That is, very, that is very generous uh, of you, Mr. President. Yes, we do have a question from yeah. Mario Battista in particular. I think it's probably the last question. Let me just check on my monitor to see whether there are any other questions. The question that Mario Battista wanted to know is very much about the Lusophone Compact. Uh, I know it's something that's very important. We also have with us um, uh, Vice President Mateus Magala, should he wish to contribute to that question. But that was the last question on the on the future of the Lucifer Compact. And I see you're encouraging more questions from members of the press, Mr. President. We also have a question from Mr. Komi Gada. So I'll take the question from Co Mr. Komi Gada, and then, if you will, the, the, the question on the Lucifer Compact. I see that we have Vice President Magala now on the screen with us. Um, so, uh, Mr. Gada, your question, over to you.
Monsieur Gada, Monsieur Komi Gada, vous avez la parole. You have the floor. Mr. Gada. Okay, so I suggest we take the first question, Mr. President, on the Lucifer contact. Mr. Gada, please do send me your question in writing using the chat facility. I'll then read it uh, to uh, the, the President and members of uh, senior management. All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mario. Uh, muito obrigado. Uh, but don't ask me anything after that, because that is all I'm going to be able to tell you uh, in Portuguese. Uh, and uh, uh, But I have my vice president, uh, Matthew Magala, with us. Let me just say that at the African Development Bank, for me as president, equal opportunities across the board it's very, very important. The two languages that we use at the bank, official languages is English and French. But then you have important constituencies. So going all the way for the Palop countries, you've got Mozambique, you've got uh, Guinea, um, um, uh, Bissau, you've got Cape Verde, um, you've got uh, 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 Angola, um, you've got uh, Magala, which one it's uh, uh, there? Saint Tome, Saint Tome. Principe. So it is Equatorial Guinea. Yeah, and Equatorial Guinea. It's very important that we are inclusive, and we are a very inclusive bank. And I have said, as African Development Bank president, I want to make sure that the Luxophone countries do not feel that they are not being given the treatment the same level they deserve. And that's why I'm very proud to have appointed uh, Vice President Matthew Magala, who is actually from Mozambique. He's the first Lusophone Vice President in the history of the bank. And that just tells you how much I really, really push on that. I just appointed another Lusophone Deputy Director General for West Africa who is from, I think, from Cape Verde. Cape Verde. And this is very, very important for equity and representativeness. Second is that the bank recognizes that a number of the countries, um, uh, the Lusophone countries, uh, need a lot of support in terms of private sector. And not many of them have uh, a, a high risk of um, uh, of debt distress. A number of them have a high risk of debt distress. And so for us at the bank, we decided that we needed to find a mechanism to help to reduce the risk for private sector to invest in those countries. And I would like to use the opportunity to really highly commend and thank uh, the government of, um, of Portugal for putting up 400 $400 million US dollars to set up the Luxophone Compact Financing Facility. It is the first of such facility ever in the history of the bank. And I am delighted that this facility will help to uh, reduce the risk of uh, a participant risk facing private sector in these Luxophone countries. It will also uh, help us as a bank to lend more in those countries because it helps to reduce the risk exposure that we will have in those countries. And I want to say that uh, we are excited about it. And um, we think that the opportunities are immense. I mean, just look at what happened in Mozambique. At the Africa Investment Forum in 2018, we helped to structure for Mozambique the liquefied natural gas project, which is a $24 billion transaction that will make Mozambique the largest, the third largest producer of liquefied natural gas in the world. Of course, that place is being taken over by, by terrorists and all of those things, and I think we will resolve that. It just tells you the kind of opportunities that exist in Luxophone countries. But I'm looking at uh, 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 Cape Verde, the blue economy, Mozambique, blue economy. Many of these countries have that. Uh, so infrastructure, energy, renewable energy, massive. So we are very excited about it. Um, and I want to thank my vice president, 
uh, Vice President Magala, who is the lead person at the bank on this, who has done an impressive job of working with the government of Portugal. I'd like him to say a few words about where we are with that. Thank Vice you, President. Mr. President. Now go ahead, Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members of the press, and Mario in particular. So I think uh, the President uh, said it all. Uh, the future of uh, the Lusophone Compact is bright, uh, first of all. Uh, two, um, I think, uh, as the President said, the Lusophone countries are not an annex in the bank, but the, the main agenda uh, of the bank. So uh, this initiative, is um, contributing to that direction. So in terms of where we are, I, you know, it's uh, almost operational. We believe by September, we'll uh, conclude the negotiation on the guarantee or, or signing of the guarantee. Uh, and that will allow us to find uh, about uh, 17 projects that have been prepared in the pipeline with $3 billion at, at, at moment. Uh, so also, um, I, I'm happy to report that uh, the Lusophone Compact has created two funds, um, uh, what, uh, the fund for Santome and fund for Cap Verde. Basically, these uh, are economies for which, you know, um, small investments like two million, you know, four million uh, uh, dollar are meaningful than big, uh, uh, you know, investment because of the size of the economy. So with these funds, which are contributed by the governments of those countries, we are now uh, uh, having a, a broader uh, uh, base to undertake what the Lusophone Compact was created for, uh, through this, uh, I would say, innovative uh, presidential initiative, which was to uh, help those risk, uh, countries to mitigate the risk and also to find ways to add more financial muscle into their transactional their, uh, relationships too, but uh, also to um, create a space to build capacity uh, uh, among those countries. So. We believe by September you'll be seeing a lot of action uh, beyond September uh, taking place in terms of uh, concrete uh, efforts to uh, equip the private sector or to fund the private sector to come to participate and, and contribute to the uh, development of Africa through job creation and other uh, endeavors as the president outline, uh, outlined in, in his remarks. So I'll stop here. Mr. President, because I think your explanation was very comprehensive, but I wanted to give update on the progress on, of, uh, on uh, uh, the Lusophone Compact. I thank you. Many thanks, uh, Vice President. Uh, yes. Yeah. There's, uh, yes, there's a question from Temitope Ponle, which is, um, I'll read it to you for those who can't see it, but I think you can all see it. What strategies are there to deepen private sector participation in the implementation of the African continental free trade area. There's also another question that you can't see on your screen that came from also from Mario Batista. There are a number of questions and concerns that I think that have been raised by the media around the new format. And let me just share the concerns with you so you get an understanding. And this will be maybe a question for you, uh, uh, Vincent, Secretary General. Um, I heard the president saying that virtual meetings were cost effective and of course, it is very true. But for us journalists, there is no comparison. Being face to face with the sources of information is critical, in particular in a context where there are not many opportunities to talk to those in charge. I think what we have right here is an opportunity to get to engage directly with members of senior management. But I think it's a particularly good question that is worth asking a concern, if we move virtual, what opportunities will there be for the press to be engaging directly face to face with you, Mr. President, and with you, Mr. Secretary uh, General. But if you will, we might take the first question uh, yeah. on the Africa free trade uh, first, and then on the format again, we, we open the conversation. Yeah, let, me, let me just, uh, sure. let me, let me, let me just deal with each other format, because I, I think we've discussed it before. Yeah. And just, I think, uh, Mario, I, I, I would like, uh, 
to see you, uh, you want to see us physically, uh, uh, which is fine. We all want to see uh, 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 oh, Ali, we have uh, Mario on the screen, Mr. President. Sorry, there is a, there's an echo back to me on this uh, system. Um, yeah, Mario, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, 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 it's always great to see you. So I know it would be nice for us to be able to see each other, give each other the high fives that we give each other when you and I talk and so on. So we all miss that. We hope that somehow we'll be able to do that. But quite frankly, this format allows me, I can meet with a thousand journalists if I wanted on this format and ask any question, which is much better because the key really is, this is going to be the model of the world going forward. We have to get used to the fact that we are now in a digital era. And it's an era that actually encourages a lot of engagement, a lot more um, uh, 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 transparency of, of conversations uh, than you will get if you are actually sitting in a room uh, 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 together with other journalists. So I think this for me is very, very important. It's the new way. And I, you know, I, 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 I think that's very important for us. We will walk with the bank and work with all the journalists also to create platforms wherein you can ask questions in, in, in more real time uh, as things happen and so on. So uh, Ms. Rai and all the others will, will do that. So i like to see you. Uh, uh, you and I can give each other a high five, but it's also good to see you uh, uh, on the screen today. Mario, always uh, good talking to you. Um, OK, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Um, the, the, on Timmy Tope's uh, point on the Africa continental uh, free trade area, uh, the Africa continental free trade area is a massive opportunity uh, for African continent. You have uh, an area with collective I mean, GTB of $3.3 trillion. And of course, for that to be realized, the potential of it to be realized fully, um, it is very important that the private sector play a very big role. And so the African Development Bank is strongly supporting the Africa Continental Free Trade Area to do that. First, the African Development Bank provided $4.8 million to, the Afri to help to establish the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat right there in Ghana. Second is you cannot trade if there's no infrastructure to trade. There are no roads. If there are no rails, if there's no energy, if there's no IT, ICT connectivity, uh, if there are no highways, if there are no ports or airports. Those are the things that the African Development Bank has been doing. We didn't wait for the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. The African Development Bank was set up to help to drive regional integration. We've been doing that since 1964. We're working towards a common market eventually. For example, in 2016 to 2019, the bank committed, I mean, spent uh, 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 40 billion US dollars on infrastructure. And that infrastructure ranged from energy to ICT, to, try, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to airports, to ports, and also to rail and highways uh, and, and, inter, uh, and power transmissions uh, across countries. And uh, that's making it possible for that regional integration to actually happen. So the work of the bank is at the core of driving that regional integration for Africa. And I can say to you, uh, 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 Temi, that in the next two years, we expect to spend an additional $2 billion on Africa continental free trade area related infrastructure. Again, to further deepen the, uh, the, the issue of regional uh, integration. One area the bank has been investing heavily on is the integration of the capital markets. Because to trade, you must be able to, uh, 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 to invest everywhere. There must be, uh, you must be able to mobilize resources also across uh, the, the, the region. So the bank has been um, funding what we call a, 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 you know, African uh, financial market linkage project that links stock exchanges all across Africa, from Cairo to Casablanca to Nairobi to Lagos and to uh, Johannesburg. We are linking markets where they 
total amount of capitalization is about $1.8 trillion. So if you're going to really do trade and investments, you need deep capital markets to mobilize resources. And so the bank is at the forefront of helping to do that. We're also providing a lot of lines of credit to commercial banks across Africa to help to drive trade, you know, intra-regional uh, uh, trade in particular. And in the last couple of years, we provided over $7 billion. Uh, I mean, the, our finance have allowed uh, trade what over $7 billion uh, to, to, to occur. And uh, uh, about $2 billion of those dollars of that, it's actually intra-regional uh, 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 trade. Now, of course, the thing is when people talk about uh, Africa, continental, free trade area, they always talk about trading. But look, if what you are trading is maize, and all I'm trading, trading is cow peas, of what good is it? So it can't you be just trading. We are not talking just about trading. The Africa continental free trade area must be a an industrialized zone. It must be a manufacturing zone for high value manufactured products. That's how you create wealth. So the African Development Bank is driving its industrialization strategy to help to support to, to, to support value chains in the region i'll give you maybe three we are going to be investing three billion dollars in pharmaceutical in, uh, uh, industries to help to build africa's manufacturing capacity uh, we are going to be uh, supported through our private sector uh, 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 group uh, work on cotton textile and garments a value chain that we, uh, we we are doing and then we are supporting now the development of what's called the um the special agro industrial processing zones that will allow African countries to industrialize their agriculture, add value to every single thing that they are producing. So regional value chains that are well supported with infrastructure that will allow Africa to unlock its capacity in all of those areas, whether it's uh, in agriculture, whether it is in textile, uh, garment, whether it's in pharmaceuticals, whether it's in IT, the bank is providing significant amount uh, 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 of support. So the Africa continental free trade area is very, very important, and we will continue to give it all it takes. It has to succeed, and it will succeed by God's grace. Many thanks indeed, Mr. President. Thank you again for being so generous with your time. I've been scanning the questions very carefully, and I can't see any additional questions from members of the press. So I think it's now time to bring uh, this uh, meeting uh, to a close. The conversation between the bank and members of the media, this isn't the end of the conversation. This is the beginning of a long going and ongoing conversation. You can, as the president mentioned, please, you can count on us to address and respond to any questions you may have either now or in the next uh, in, in over the next weeks and months so we look forward to be engaging with you thank you very much indeed and look forward to seeing you very soon thank you mr president and thank you senior manager thank you Simon. thank you press members thank you okay au revoir au revoir muito obrigado okay, okay. mario muito obrigado <laughs> thank you mr president okay Bye -bye. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Thank you, guys. Congratulations.